Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. With this video series, I will be analyzing and discussing Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden, one chapter at a time. Now, at the time of these recordings, I have thoroughly read the book, but I've not yet run our campaign. And unlike my crafting series, these videos will offer general criticisms and advice without taking a deep dive into the changes and modifications that I would make for my personal campaign. Now, warning before we begin, these videos will be full of spoilers. They are for DMs only. If you are playing uh, Rime of the Frostbaden or plan on playing it, please, please, please do not watch these videos, but feel free to come back afterward. So for this video, we'll be discussing Chapter 1, which is Ten Towns. This is a very big, thorough chapter, uh, probably one of the biggest that we've seen in a 5e adventure. You can see by the very impressive map. And it's it's built like a modular design. There's a quest in every single town, a quest for every town. We get to explore the entire Ten Towns region, although we don't have to. We are given some starter quests but the idea is the players are basically just supposed to wander around the Ten Towns region and complete a bunch of quests and essentially get them out of Tier 1, which, compared to some other adventures, Cough, Storm King's Thunder Cough, that basically want to skip over those low levels as quickly as possible in order to get to the real meat of the action, which typically starts in Tier 2, I appreciate that there is some good content in here, and and some of it is tied into the first quest arc. Now, one of the biggest issues with Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden, is that it's really three plot lines put together. That's a big uh, issue for a lot of DMs to have to tackle, to make uh, the story make sense, to tie everything together, and I look forward to making those adjustments and modifications in my campaign. But I like to think of Tier 1 as being almost its own self-contained storyline, which begins with just helping out in Ten Towns, becoming, you know, kind of the heroes of the area, and ends with the climactic struggle against the Dwergar, who are building the fortress and ultimately trying to repel that Shardalan dragon that's going to come through and destroy everything. I think that's actually a really strong kind of first season of your campaign, and I would pretty much maintain that as is. It probably needs the least amount of work compared to the second half of the campaign, which needs a lot of work to really bring it together. Um, on the other hand, if you were players, you know, we're looking forward to facing the actual person who is on the cover, uh, O'Reel, although I keep pronouncing her Aural, because that's what I, those words <laughs> make me want to pronounce it as. Uh, you're not really going to get that here much at all. And one of the problems is the opening quest, the cold open, are very, very problematic. The cold-hearted killer and nature spirits. First of all, nature spirits is not really much going on. There's a bunch of tri tri twingas, twingas, which were in Tomb of Annihilation, just copied from there. These little nature spirits that are supposed to be kind of pseudo sentient they're kind of little i don't know friendly gremlins or something you're given a little lantern to go find them maybe you could turn that into some kind of a, a side quest track where i would make like a pokemon thing where you can find them like everywhere and maybe you can gather them and they can do different perks or something you can turn it into, in other words an ongoing quest your players can do but for an opening thing to, to add some flavor to the region i think it fails completely um for cold-hearted killer you know a lot of dms have given their two cents about this one i think Obviously, the pro a murder mystery is cool, but a murder mystery in which the murder the mystery is already solved and your whole goal is just to hunt down the killer is way less cool, especially when the killer's motivations are nebulous and weird compared to what your player should be learning about. I think it's literally like his spirit was cannibalized by this frost druid spirit or something, and then the frost druid is doing Aurel's Aurel's bidding, you know, with an ice dagger and stuff, and that just doesn't end up you don't end up meeting a whole lot of the frost druids and in and oral herself doesn't really have anything to do with this it just doesn't have that kind of flavor that i'm looking for the point behind it is to get your players to track down the killers who already know the identity which means the mystery is solved and you're just supposed to travel around the different towns to try to find him and then take him out but he's also a freaking uh what cr3 i think capable of doing uh he's got multi-attack 75 hit points like it seems like a disaster for level 1s to try to tackle, so this quest has a lot of problems. You can, with heavy modifications, you could still run it, but I would change it to be an actual murder mystery. I would probably change the motivations to be make them make more sense than just possessed by a evil frost druid. 
Um, you could still use like the ice dagger stuff. I think that's kind of cool. And you may have to change the actual scenario in which they find this killer uh, in terms of like the stat block and stuff. You can still make them a, a, a strong, you know, threat for a level one party without literally having this person be able to wipe the entire party down. Because again, this is supposed to be the opening quest. So as written, I think it's extremely problematic. But with modifications, you could still do it. But as a like, here's what you're supposed to do at level one. I I would definitely stay away from it. So we're off on a bad foot already because I don't like any of those starting quests. But the good news is every single one of these towns has its own quest. And a lot of these quests are very good and they include their own dungeons and scenarios and everything else. And we're going to go through them kind of in a montage sequence. I'm trying not to make these videos be too long, but this chapter and chapter two have a lot of content in there. There's multiple uh, scenarios and situations to cover, so these are probably going to be the longest chapters in this series. So let's cover them in alphabetical order because that's the way the book covers them as well. So starting with Bremen, and obviously I'm using Roll20 here to showcase all of the visuals, and we also get maps for every single town, which means as a DM I look forward to running them on one hand, although here's the thing, do you actually want to run every single one of these towns? because there are 10 of them, which means all of them are gonna have NPCs. And if you're trying to create memorable situations and recurring NPCs, you're gonna end up with a, too big of a cast. There's just too much to keep track of. Now, the way chapter one is paced is that, assuming you start at level one, you're supposed to reach level two after completing the first quest, level three after completing the third quest, and level four after completing the fifth quest. So it's designed where we get 10 quests with 10 towns, but the game really only wants you to do about half of them in order to reach the point in which you should be starting to tackle basically the end game for this opening tier, which is to go to uh, Sunblight in Chapter 3 and then defend the towns in Chapter 4. Or I guess the way it's written is an either or. We'll get we'll get to that in a, in a later chapter when we cover it. So, but it's modular because we can pick and choose. And in fact, we can even pick and choose our starting town and a lot of these towns, you can just pick up whatever the quests are and put them somewhere else. I mean, even even a lot of the towns have uh, uh, areas that are you know associated with the lakes and the rivers, and they have dungeons that are there. So, but even then, you can easily move them around. The only ones I think that aren't maybe Goodmead and Dugan's Hole, I think, aren't anywhere. And Bryn Shander isn't near a lake, so maybe it'll be a little harder to do like the lake ones from there. But it's really easy to just pick up and move them around as you need them. So even if you don't particularly like what's in a town, you can move that. And I would recommend just using certain towns and certain quests, which is what we're going to go over. And if you stick around to the end of this video, I'm actually going to rank um, all 10 of these quests from my favorite to my least favorite. So Bremen is a fairly small town. It's on the western edge. Uh, it's got the quest of Lake Monster. It also has a nice inn with a friendly innkeeper named Cora, who actually technically has another quest, or at least she can lead you to um, either Care Denevel or Care Konig, because uh, her son has been corrupted by the Shardle and the Black Eyes, which is a really fun tease for what that stuff is and what it can do. And ultimately, you will find that uh, the son character in Care Denevel in the Knights of the Black Sword. So it's a really good hook to lead them to there. And I love when quests can lead you from one area. I mean, it's the open world model, lead you from one area to another, and then that area has got more quests and things to do. So that does an excellent job. Um, if you're not starting in Bremen, then I would just put Cora any in any town. She can be the innkeeper in literally any of the towns, and she can give the players that quest to go find her son. And that gives you like a personal connection and just a fun like rescue mission. It's, it's a really good hook. Um, and I would just call it Cora's Loss, because that's kind of what it is. It's not even really count as a full-on quest, but it just is leading you from one area to another. So don't forget about that one. The actual quest is Lake Monster. <sighs> I am going to rant every time there's a quest about an awakened monster or awakened beast. It's a really odd part of this campaign. It's, this campaign is supposed to be darker and more horror based I mean there's an everlasting winter it's night all the time things are getting very grim there's towns are having human sacrifices like it's just it's already a tough place and they're getting even things are getting even bleaker and then you've got all these awakened animals there's these evil frost druids running around who just cast awaken on all these random animals and then they wreck havoc but and sometimes it can be kind of evil but then as soon as animals start talking it's just a freaking Disney movie to me now I love my Disney movies but it feels very weird to put that in 
like John Carpenter's The Thing. So there's a really bizarre... In fact, there's a later, uh, one of the mid-dungeons at one point in the middle of this very serious dungeon, there's like a there's a ice skating like walrus that runs up to you and talks to you. Like, that's fucking silly as hell, and it was just too much for me. So I have a problem. As you can imagine, all the ones with talking animals are going to be at the bottom of my list, and that is what Lake Monster is. Lake Monster, you are searching for a uh, the classic Loch Ness monster. Uh, here it's a awakened plesi- plesiosaurus. And it's just a whole bunch of exploration. It's a lot of skill checks. Maybe there's some themes with trying to go out there, and maybe it'd be creepy at first. But then it's kind of the twist is that it's just it's a it's a awakened plesiosaurus that just can chat with your party, and you talk to them. And you're like, okay, can you quit? You know, harassing the people. It's just I think it's really stupid, um, and I'm not into it. I don't really like any of the awakened animals things. I'm not a fan at all. So thumbs down on uh, Lake Monster. Also, I believe there's no map associated with that one either, which that's a bummer. Bryn Shander is the biggest city. You may recognize this town from Storm King's Thunder. In our Storm King's Thunder, Storm King's Thunder campaign, we were here as well. Um, there's actually not a lot going on here, despite being the biggest city and being the hub. This is I don't see any way of running this campaign without your players at least stopping by in uh, uh, Bryn Shander, let alone probably using this as their main base of operations. Plus, this one has the only one, I believe... Uh, that has the actual pictures of like the speaker and even the sheriff. So because we get some good information on them, I would lean towards using uh, speaker Duvessa Shane as probably the introductory quest giver um, because she's got a name and, and a history and a, and a picture and you know just more information about her compared to a lot of the other speakers and areas. So I would definitely be inclined to uh, use her and she seems like just kind of a good person in general. In terms of stuff in Bryn Shander, it's a little bit disappointing compared to other towns. They've got a blacksmith, they've got a, uh, a shrine, a house of the Morning Lord, which that has a character, a little gnome who dresses up kind of like in a bear outfit, makes him look like a teddy bear, um, who can point you to Black Cabin specifically. All of these uh, towns, I believe, have rumors that can lead you to the Chapter 2 quests, which the only difference between Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 is it Chapter 2? It's the same modular design where it has a bunch of quests, I think a dozen of them rather than 10, and they're just further out in the region rather than in the 10 town space specifically, so you'd have to worry about some overland travel. And they're designed, I believe, from levels 4 to, I want to say, 7. So Chapter 2, it's not really numerical where you do 1, 2, and 3. It's more like you do, you know, probably most of 1, and then go maybe 1 or 2 of 2, and then do 3, 4, and then you do more of 2. You basically constantly jump back and forth between Chapter 2 because that's got the... Um, a lot of different areas and things you can do. So um, keep that in mind when we're going through these organizations of the chapters. The actual quest in Bryn Shander is Foaming Mugs. This one also does not have a map. It's a very classic D&D quest where some dwarves run up to you and say, hey, our wagon of shipment was um, waylaid. I believe it was actually attacked by a yeti, but then when you get there, you realize the yeti's long gone. It's been captured by a bunch of goblins. You have to track the goblins down. It does a decent job of bringing the players out of the Ten Towns region and putting them in the more Icewind Dale region, although not very far. You're still in the area, you're just not on a road or in a town. Um, and, you know, goblins are a very classic D&D thing. Uh, they, they do have a wagon with uh, being pulled by polar bears, so you get that kind of flavor. I think it's, it's decent, although you'd have to concoct a map for it because it's essentially like a random encounter map. The biggest thing is that this one can lead to a good Chapter 2 quest, which is what I would do, is if your players complete this quest, return to Bryn Shander, and then the speaker can say, oh, you did such a good job with those goblins. Can you go deal with the goblins in their main fortress, which is um, Karkalok, Karkalok? Uh, which has a really fun twist that we'll talk about in chapter two. So that can that, and I'm always looking for these connections. You know, Kor's Loss can lead to the Knights of the Black Sword. Uh, the uh, Copper can lead to the Black Cabin, and now you can lead to uh, this Goblin Foaming Mugs quest can lead to Corkalog. So I'm not a huge fan of Foaming Mugs in general. It just feels very basic, but it's a decent introductory quest. Uh, it does have a bit of that flavor of Icewind Dale, and it can lead to a chapter two quest to deal with the goblins overall because you've just dealt with them earlier. So that is uh, Bryn Shander and Foaming Mugs. Kind of an okay, basically. I'll put it middle of the road. Care Deneval. Uh, this one really has nothing in it aside from the Care, which is a castle, which is currently home to a bunch of Levistus worshipping knights who are using the Shardolin Black Ice. Um, and they are being spoken to by Levistus, who is a one of the arch devils of the Nine Hells. I'm not a fan of how they insert the devil stuff into this 
campaign in general. In fact, the Dwargars are supposed to be led by Asmodeus. That's just too many factions, too many um, plates being spun. In well, I don't want to talk about it. Too. In my crafting series, I'll get down to this deeper, but I would double down on the actual Aetherin and the Netheril plot and have that affect all of these things, including the Black Ice and the Dwargar and everything. Have that affect them rather than devil stuff. Or you could twist it and make it so Levistus is even more prominent and maybe Levistus is, you know, warring with Oriel or, you know, is trapped under Aetherin or something and do something cool there. But essentially this is an entirely additional faction that your players can run into here. This is a very, very tricky situation because it could almost be a social encounter with your players. Um, especially it's designed where if, if they're notable, the knights can actually uh, invite your players into this care and kind of talk to them because Levistus says, hey, you need to ally with these against our common enemy of uh, Aetherin and Oriel, which is interesting because obviously there's these these knights give off an aura of straight evil because they're devil worshippers. They also have the speaker under house arrest who's kind of being kept blackmailed as a hostage because he's got um, the uh, actual townsfolk like in a prison underneath. In fact, this does have a full map. So the weird thing is, as much as I think this is an interesting quest, it's also a very tricky one to pull off because it's probably going to be more of a social encounter rather than a actual dungeon crawl. In fact, if it's a dungeon crawl, you lose this entire faction, which should pop up again in the third act uh, when your players make it to Aetherin at the end, and then Avarice can show up with the actual knights as additional faction. And Avarice is a member of the Arcane Brotherhood, which is a very major character and a major faction in this campaign, and she is just chilling here, and your players should absolutely not fight her, although I guess they can talk to her. So all of this is good, but it's also hard to pull off in D&D, at least in my experience, in order to make your players think like, hey, this is, you know, you can chat here, you can talk, it's not hostile, but your players are going to start realizing, oh wait, these are probably bad people, we need to f be fighting them. And if it becomes a big blow up into a combat encounter, I, you've either potentially wiped your players out or you've wiped out a good faction. You know, you're going to have to be run this with extreme care um, and probably not early on. So I think it is worth showcasing. Um, I'm not even sure it's worth using this map until your players are ready to go fight them. And even then, maybe when they're ready to fight them, you see it to where most of them are gone. Basically, I still want to use this faction in the campaign, but I don't want to just have it be a neat, you know, bow to tie uh, at the end of this tier one section. So your players can still deal with things here, and including, you know, being brought here to look for that one, uh, the Korra's son, uh, Huar War, or something like that. Um, can find him here, and that's a good tease about how the Black Eyes can corrupt people and kind of gradually turn them evil, which is something I would definitely play with with the Dwargar as well. So, interesting place. Probably the most difficult area to pull off because this should not be a standard dungeon crawl, at least the first time your players actually uh, end up here. That's Care Denival. The next area is... Flip some pages because I'm actually looking through the book because that's a little bit faster than rolling through Roll20. Care Koneg, which is honestly one of my favorite towns, despite it being a very, very tiny. We basically have towns and villages. The town the actual towns are like Bryn Chander, Targos, Tourmaline, uh, and East Haven, I believe, are all like a couple hundred people, all the way up to maybe a thousand for the biggest ones, which is still a pretty small town. And then the you have the tiny villages, which are only anywhere from like 50 to a 200 people. Like it's very, very tiny, and this is one of them. But Karakonig is really fun, starting with the fact that it's got a really fun uh, ex-adventurer, drunken dragonborn of a speaker who just wanders the town and just drinks and... He's got, you know, he probably saw some shit, you know, as an adventurer and retired. Maybe all his, maybe all his former party died, and he kind of drinks to keep that down. You know, I would really play up this character as a really fun character for the players to interact with as the speaker. Um, the local inn and tavern is being run by a bunch of bickering sisters, which is really fun. It's got a ranger who can sell you dog sleds. It's just got a lot going on here, and then it has a uh, extremely important quest. One of the most critical quests you can run in Chapter 1 because it directly leads into the Dwergar plot that is the culmination of the entire Tier 1 arc of Icewind Dale and that is the Unseen. The Unseen which is a really cool, it starts out as a mystery where there's like things going missing, you don't know what's going on because Dwergar have the ability to just go invisible at will, which is always a fascinating trait for an enemy to have. And it, you, you know, follow the tracks and it leads to this whole little dungeon, which is the Dwergar outpost. And here you get to actually meet the Dwergar um, 
uh, threat for the first time. It's a fun little dungeon. It's got a little ogre zombie chained up that the enemies can release and you have to deal with. Definitely not something I would throw at the players at level one, but it would be just the perfect thing um, as you're doing some more of these level one quests. And the thing is you want to try to balance that between you know, give your players, you probably want to force them into, into one of the quests for level one, and so you can balance it properly, um, or do like I'm going to do and start them at level two, and then you can introduce all of these quests, and then let your players kind of pick and choose which ones they want to do next, so that's kind of the balance between how to do an open world, for me at least, uh, because I can't prep all that stuff, and I have ones that I like more than others, I would give them all those quests initially, or at least as many as I could, you know, if I want to start them in Bryn Shander, say, hey, uh, you know, Tourmaline's having a problem with their mine, and, and, you know, we've got goblin problems here, and then East Haven's got this going on. You know, you can point them to different towns, give them those initial quest things, and then that will take them to different towns. Uh, you don't have to use that freaking cold-hearted killer thing. In this case, um, your player should tackle it maybe about halfway or towards the end of doing all of those quests that you want them to do, because at the end of this, whether they kill the actual uh, son of... Um, uh, Zardarok or not, they should find a note that leads them to the other sun's hidden base, which is in East Haven, which is awesome if your players went to East Haven first and then did a bunch of stuff there, and we'll get to that in a second because East Haven's amazing, and then they get here, figure out the note, and they go, oh shit, we now we know where the hidden base is, and you go back to East Haven and root that out, and then that East Haven ferry, they will then find the map that leads to uh, chapter 3, which is uh, Sunblight and Zardarok. So that's a really great like step-by-step-by-step -step -step quest chain where they can start dealing with these uh, Dwergar. But just be aware that once they start finding those, they might be less inclined to do other stuff and instead follow this thread, um, not knowing that that's like the main quest of this first area, which is something that you need to be aware of when you're giving these quests. But I think this one is really fun, and it's critical for that reason because it starts that chain of events. So be very careful about when to start it, but I would absolutely start this because it's a good dungeon, and it does a great job of teasing the Dwergar threat, which is really fun. Um, so we go from one of my favorite towns and favorite quests to one of the worst ones, which is Dugan's Hole. This is a, literally, it says it's like a backwater Hicksville, a bunch of inbred, just idiots, <laughs> which is funny that it essentially says that. Um, the population of 50, there's like a cluster of villages. There's just nothing going on here. There's absolutely nothing. And the quest is horrible. It's horrible. It, again, it's, it's that awakened animals thing. It's a giant woolly mammoth. His frost giant buddy has died. Um, he blames the local villagers, and he's kidnapped, like, some children and sends out some winter wolves to extort the town, and they can talk. It's just all very silly and goofy and weird. I don't like the dungeon that's associated with it. I don't like any of the characters. None of this works for me, and I don't like this town. So I would recommend completely skipping this area if possible. The only notable thing in this entire area is that there's, like, a weird Stonehenge thing called the 20 Stones of Thrun. And there's no real notes on it. I mean, there's a little bit of lore, like, tease, but you can turn that into something else if you want. But otherwise, there's just no good reason to go to Dugan's Hole and waste your time with this or this quest. If you like this stuff, then let me know in the comments, because I think that was just a huge no for me. Huge thumbs down. I'm not even going to show you that map, because it's not worth showing. East Haven. Despite being a gigantic map that looks like it could rival uh, Bryn Shander, it's actually only the third uh, biggest town in Ten Towns region, and although Ten, uh, Bryn Shander is the hub, East Haven actually has the most amount of content in it in this campaign. It is the densest location in all of Ten Towns. You should not run this campaign without including East Haven, because there's a lot going on here. I had to write down all my notes about East Haven. Uh, first of all, it was founded by thieves, which is funny. Pickpocketing is basically legal here, which I think is hilarious. Uh, and a lot of rogues could have very much fun in East Haven. Um, it's got that East Haven ferry, as I mentioned, which if you play your cards right, your players will visit East Haven first. Uh, maybe even know that the ferry's frozen over, but not really think about it. It's, it's a location they're even going to go to. And then uh, once they learn about the location from the unseen Dwerger outpost, they will return to East Haven and then realize, oh shit, there's Dwerger here, which is awesome. Um, there's a seance the, the players can get involved in, which is really interesting, um, with one of the, like, there's a local bard in an inn who can tell the story of this, like, white lady ghost, and there's a whole seance there where she can, like, creepily write answers and stuff on the 
uh, window, like the frosted window. It's all very like cool and thematic. It's just really interesting. When you first arrive, there's supposed to be a giant public execution of a human sacrifice, which is Dazan, which is one of the main Arcane Brotherhood members. So that's something that should very much tease the whole Arcane Brotherhood being here. I think there are modifications you can make to make that more interesting. I know a lot of DMs are talking about maybe making Dazan a more, or Zahn, a more, um, notable character and maybe even have him be like an initial quest giver so that when he's executed publicly a literally like a witch trial type you know burning um it affects your players a lot more so that's a cool twist i would also maybe make him the simulcrum and maybe make the real one in the lost spire of netheril which is a fun twist to uh a chapter two and make it so that either um valin knows where he is in the lost spire or make it so that the players get some kind of like magic compass off his body or something that can locate that but definitely tie that into the fact that he is actually still around in that like cloned capacity whether or not it's the clone of the real one there's just a lot of cool stuff going on there that can tie in the netheril and the arcane brotherhood stuff which is all extremely important and you know uh, uh, should be important in your campaign i would definitely play that up so that's a really cool moment that can happen i think it's just a classic theme of being in that dark oppressive uh area as having a giant freaking you know witch trial burning human sacrifice thing um, the actual quest is Toil and Trouble, and this one is okay. Um, it's not one I would recommend at an early level. It's got a nice map here. It's, it's like a cove, um, in the frozen lake, so you can see kind of much of it is, like, frozen in. It's a very cool-looking map, um, run by a hag who has a cauldron that could, like, just constantly, um, provides like infinite food which is a great thing to happen during a you know huge famine situation that you we have in Icewind Dale there's also a giant frost giant skeleton that the uh, hag can utilize it's very powerful enemies you have to be very careful of running this one too early I would not run it too early as a complete side dungeon I think it's um, pretty solid though it's a fun little map and gives some fun situations but almost more importantly than this situation is the aftermath which is there's additional quests that you can trigger either based on the fact that there are Dwergar in East Haven in the ferry trying to steal Shardalin, or that once you turn that cauldron over to the speaker for a nice reward, um, the Zentarum will attempt to steal the cauldron from the speaker, and that triggers two different quests, which is uh, either cauldron capers or Shardalin capers, I believe they're called, and they both use this same map, so it's a really neat idea is you can use either one of these depending on which one's more interesting but essentially turn your players into kind of just defending against this uh sudden attack by either the dwergar or the zentarum so that's it leads to some really cool chain of events in other words and it's very tempting to make east haven a major hub of the campaign because there's so much going on here i mean multiple quests multiple maps multiple events there's it, it's a lot. It, it it shocks me as somebody who read this knowing that Bryn Shander was the main town and then Bryn Shander was almost passed over in uh, in favor of East Haven. Like, East Haven is actually the main town when it comes to the content in Icewind Dale. So, and I really like all of this stuff here. It gives you a lot of options and a lot of good flavor. So, Good Mead um, is okay. I mean, it's a pretty small town. It's, it's friendly enough. Um, the main thing that happened here is the, a Verbeeg, which is kind of a cross between like a giant and an ogre, I guess, um, stole a lot of the famous, uh, mead, which is brewed, I believe from like bees. It's like honey mead, very famous in the region. Uh, and the, he, uh, in doing so he ended up killing the speaker. So the town is without a speaker right now, which is one problem. And the other problem is that the mead is missing like we gotta go after the mead and your players can track the verbi down to its lair and it's a pretty solid little quest with very powerful enemies again probably don't want to run this one at level one but could make for an interesting maybe stealth type you know mission there's i mean there's an ogre there's a bear there's a bunch of really strong enemies in there and it's got a really fun twist at the end in fact i guess i can show that map since i'm talking about it where your players no matter what happens i mean they could end up killing the guy um, and they exit the place and they realize the reason he stole that mead was because his uh, potential mate is like shown up with her gift for him and they're trying to get it busy and you realize like oh no like I've just ruined their chance at love and you know they're actually like more maybe sentient than we thought and it's just it's a really great twi uh, twist that can uh, upset the players or hopefully add some cool stuff and it's a neat little dungeon with some different things going on which uh, goats and things you can use to try to distract you know the enemies it, it's got it's it's a it's a good quest um, very careful if you're going to run it early because there's some very powerful enemies here 
And it ties into the town's dilemma of, hey, our speaker's killed. There's an interesting little side plot where um, there's a speaker who's been nominated to be the next, or a, a dwarf who's been nominated to be the next speaker, but he's got he's been like blackmailed by the Zentarum, I believe, and he's not a good pick. Whereas you've got this other woman who is a better pick, but she doesn't really want the job. Or your players, you know, if they complete this mission, one of them could elect to be speaker, which is probably stupid because they're going to be off doing adventures. So if your players are into that kind of political drama and intrigue, then you would have fun doing that. Um, if not, then just make it a simple, probably social encounter would be fine. But despite there not being a whole lot going on, um, I do like this uh, quest quite a bit. I think it's pretty flavorful and fun. So generally thumbs up on good mead and the mead must flow. Lonely Wood is Poopsville. I'm not a fan of Lonely Wood. Um, it's very tiny. There's nothing really going on here. Um, the only quest is the white moose, which is another awakened animal, though this one is a lot more aggressive and deadly than the other ones, uh, and is literally just hunting down, um, I think, uh, loggers and hunters and things as, like, revenge, but it turns out, um, he's, he's using, like, this magical scrying mirror that I believe is home to also one of the evil frost druids, so the whole frost druid thing, I'm, it, it's tricky to wrap my head around, because it's supposed to be this extra faction that works for Oriel, and they're just kind of evil for evil's sake, I guess. There's not a good motivation there, and they're just kind of fucking around with people. Um, it's just more annoying than anything else. But the actual map is kind of interesting. It, it offers a nice little puzzle here with a moon dial. Um, it's just a cool-looking map. It's it's that classic, like, you know, magical ruins in the middle of the ice, and there's, like, a little cave section. So I'm tempted to repurpose this map and use it in some other fashion rather than associated with this quest. Uh, because I'm not, again, I'm not a fan of the Awakened Animals thing, and frankly, the whole Frost Druid thing, I think is just, you can use them, but if you're going to, it needs to be a little more clear-cut about what their motivations are, and the problem is, as written, Oriole is not really a factor in the story, which is a huge problem. Um, you know, I'm just trying to stick to Chapter 1 for now, but that's one of the reasons why the Frost Druids don't really make, have a whole lot to do. There's not good motivations there, other than just screwing around with people, Awakening Animals, and just generally being dicks, so... I do like this map, though, but I'm not a fan of the actual quest that's associated with it. Targos is one of the biggest uh, cities in uh, Ten Towns, which doesn't make any sense to me, because if you compare this map to the East Haven map, this map looks like it's a third of the population, when in fact it's supposed to be bigger than East Haven. That makes zero sense to me. Um, Targos is run by Zentarum, which seems pretty fun. But then there's not actually much going on here. And, and East Haven's a lot more flavorful with the whole, like, founded by pickpockets thing, uh, which is a weird contrast because that also makes it seem like it's like Zentarum run, but it's actually Targos is the one that's Zentarum run. I'm tempted to kind of combine those together. Again, do we really want to use all these towns? Or do we want to pick and choose our favorites and then have the other towns just be like kind of, you know, pass over, you know, uh, what do you call it? The one stop sign, you know, towns that we don't really care about too much. I'm tempted to make. Uh, East Haven, the actual maybe Zentarum run town, that makes a lot more sense, it's bigger, there's more shit going on there. This one, there's not really much going on here, other than it, we actually do get faces for the speaker and the captain, which is similar to uh, Bryn Shander, despite, again, not much actual content here. Um, it does have one of the best quests in Chapter 1, with the caveat that I'm not sure it needs to start in Targo, so this is the mountain climb one, and the way it starts is a dog comes up to you, it's a sled dog, it's obviously not part of its sled anymore, and it takes you to his master's house, and, um, uh, what's his name, Keegan Valerian, uh, mentions that his husband has gone missing after taking a bunch of adventurers to Kelvin's, Kelvin's Cairn, and your quest is, of course, to go and rescue him, and hopefully the adventurers, and go to Kelvin's Cairn, and it's a really awesome, I mean, I can show you the map, in a moment, but it's it's just got all the flavors of like avalanche and frostbite and yetis. Like there's just so much cool stuff going on there. Again, probably not one to run at level one unless you want to scale it down, or unless you really want to make it really of a thematic challenging um, uh, scenario because it is the most flavorful chapter one quest in all of chapter one. The problem is if you look at the distance between Kelvin's Cairn and uh, Targos, it's really nuts, and I believe this one does uh, scale miles-wise, so it is a almost 20-mile journey, uh, even for a sled dog, that is a long time, that is like several days, and, you know, as much as I love quests that take you to other areas, which is exactly what that one quest from Bremen, you know, going to Care Denevelle, um, the problem is this one is a time, it's supposed to be uh, a urgency, you know, literally like, oh god, what happened to this guy, and when he was 
you know, took everybody up this mountain. If the sled dog returned, that means something really bad has happened. So unless you're going to do the video game magic thing of like, well, you know, that issue will solve itself as soon as you make it to that region. Otherwise, it's on pause, which you don't necessarily want to do in D&D. Then you've created this urgent situation where your players have to then beeline it to Kelvin's Cairn. And it mentions, hey, you can go to all these towns, run up all of them, and then go to Kelvin's Cairn or try to make it there, uh, like kind of across the Dwarven Valley. But again, if you're just running through all these towns, like are you just picking up these quests and like, all right, I'll go take care of them later. I got to go do this one. So I don't like the urgency thing there. The way to fix that, in my opinion, would be to put the meeting the dog or the husband or whatever else in a closer town. So you could put it in, for example, Kerr Konig or uh, Tourmaline would both be a lot closer and make it so, A, it makes sense that, you know, the, the dog would survive that journey by itself, and B, that your players would then immediately say, okay, well, we can go ahead and head over there. It's, you know, a 10-mile journey or five miles or whatever else. So, or, you know, put it in any town, really. It doesn't have to be in Targos. Like I said, I'm, I'm tempted to make Targos a, ta a Passover town and put a lot of the more content in East Haven, and then I would put that mountain climb. I definitely would absolutely run mountain climb. Every single uh, campaign of Rhyme of the Frostbane should run mountain climb, but I don't think it necessarily needs to originate in Targos. I think you need to play around with it and originate it anywhere because it really doesn't matter where it originates from because the destination is Kelvern's Cairn, which is awesome. In fact, let's show the map now that I'm done boasting about it, but it does a really cool, like... It's part exploration, um, you know, crawling through a bunch of um, exp um, uh, situations, which which covers the exploration pillar. There are uh, people you can rescue, which covers the role playing social pillar, and then there is potential combat with some yetis, which definitely does the obviously combat pillar. So it's just the perfect designed quest, so thematic, awesome. Very careful running it in the early levels because yetis are extremely powerful. Unless you want to run, you know, a more gritty, powerful thing. Um, but I would definitely trigger it maybe somewhere other than uh, Targos. Um, rounding out towards the end, we've got Tourmaline, which uh, has a very friendly half-orc speaker who does not have the authority of the militia behind him. Poor guy. Uh, seems like a nice dude, though. Um, it's got a really good quest that is not very flavorful for Icewind Dale, but it could be a good transition because, or and especially a good starter quest. I think it's this might be one of the best level one starting quests. Um, is the gem mine where you realize a bunch of kobolds have had to you know leave whatever situation they're in because it, it's brutal out there and move into this mine. And but that's not even the main problem. The main problem is a grell has come up from the underdark because mines always dig too deep and is starting to be, you know, eating miners and stuff. So your players end up uh, exploring that and, and meeting both of those factions, the Grell, which is a hostile faction, and the Kobolds, which doesn't have to be a hostile faction. They can deal with them from a social level. It's a nice little map. Uh, it doesn't have really anything hardly to do with, you know, snow and freezing and what's going on in the main plot. But it can lead to some cool moments where you can even bring the kobolds back to town and try to get them like jobs or maybe have them work in the mines or something. I think that could lead to some neat moments and help establish your players as helping a very, you know, a small town with its with its issues. So I do like this quest. I like the dungeon. I like the situation. Um, it, just with the caveat that it might not have that flavor that you're looking for for uh, the actual, you know, Icewind Dale area. And this one, again, does not have to be tied to Tourmaline. Uh, you know, you can put a mine, like, really in any of the towns, and it would be just perfectly fine. You could do, hey, Bryn Shander, we've got a mine you need to go check out. You know, it's just, it's it's a, it's a nice one-shot, one-off. It doesn't lead to anything else, which is why it al almost might be a good one to literally start your players with, because it's, you know, a classic D&D way to start, which is uh, a cave and some kobolds. And I believe that is the end of chapter one. That's it. So we've covered all of the towns and all of the quests and even some of the uh, minor uh, non-quests that are still worth talking about. Um, you mentioned some of my favorite towns. Um, East Haven, for sure, has a lot going on. Kerkonig is great with some really fun characters. Um, Goodmead speaker situation is pretty good, and Bryn Shander has um, you know those great uh, talking heads, and is just the main hub town of the area. Um, and then the smaller areas I'm not too fond of, like Lonelywood, Bremen, Dugan's Hole. There's just not a whole lot going on there that um, would make sense for your players to travel there. But do note the location of these towns, and then where other events are. Um, for example, if you know your players are going to end up going to the Sea of Moving Ice, which means they're probably going to end up either going up the road to Termaline and Lonelywood or going up to Bremen in order to then make the journey to these other areas. They will probably still get to those areas in general. 
And if you end up leaving Addison and Sunblight down here, there's a good reason your players will travel down to Dugan Soul. So you still need, even if you're not planning on really doing much with these towns, you're probably still going to have to at least prep the basics. Um, but I wouldn't even go into the point. I mean, you know, and, and the book does a decent job of saying, okay, here's the inn, here's the name of the innkeeper and all that. So your players get like basics in there, but don't feel the need to necessarily run content in every single town. And again, if you're, if you're trying to do that, your players are going to spend too much time in those lower levels, and it's just going to feel like they're not really getting anywhere with the main quest or anything. So I would, you know, pick and choose your favorites, run those, and then you can still have those towns prepped, but focus on a few towns and a few characters to really expand it. And then when the big event happens in chapter four, that becomes all the more devastating where, you know, yes, some of the towns are going to get destroyed that maybe we don't care about as much, but in this one and this one, oh no, we really don't want to lose, you know, Trovis and the sisters or, you know, these people in East Haven and all that kind of stuff. And I think that creates a lot better uh, connection to that. So, um, as I promised, I will rank the quests from my favorite to least favorite in Chapter 1. Favorite quest, Mountain Climb. I think it does an absolutely incredible job of everything I want from a quest and is very flavorful. Uh, number two is Mead Must Flow. I actually think that's a very interesting quest with the Verbeeg, and it's just got a lot going on with the powerful monsters uh, and the fun twist at the end where it's actually just getting some booze for his girlfriend and all that. So even though he's done bad things, he's it's just it's an interesting quest from a moral standpoint, and it's got a fun little dungeon crawl. Beautiful Mind, just a very standard, nice introductory uh, dungeon crawl. The Unseen is another good dungeon, but also uh, very critical to the main quest. Does a great job of starting the Dwerger chain. Black Swords, tricky to pull off, but a interesting scenario where you deal with this devil-worshipping faction and learn more about Black Ice and Shardalan and possibly clear them out or just learn about them, meet Avarice, you know, meet some characters, maybe you turn into a heist situation. It has a lot of potential there. Um, that's kind of all the ones that I consider good. The medium ones would be Foaming Mugs. You know, goblins are very classic. Um, going out and having to fight a bunch of goblins that are with a polar bear wagon is kind of interesting. But I think the better thing it does is lead to um, the big goblin base, which is more interesting, which we'll talk about in Chapter 2. Um, Toil and Trouble is the other one that's okay. Um, it's got a nice map. Again, doesn't have much to do with anything, but it can lead to better content, which is the, uh, the cauldron capers. So that's pretty fun. And then the ones that I do not like that are very much thumbs down or all the awakened animal ones lake monster white moose and hold up i think are easily skippable in my campaign but please let me know what your thoughts are for running chapter one specifically of ice wind dale rhyme of the frost maiden and i will see you again when we cover chapter two thanks